Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and your chief cat herder for the next hour. And I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. We have a fantastic guest on a vital topic, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I, I'm absolutely delighted to bring uh, Deborah Keg Franson here. She's the Associate Vice President and Dean of Online Continuing Education at the University of Utah. She is also someone who won a fantastic award from EDUCAUSE last year, the 2020 Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Leadership Award, which is really well merited. That's what we're gonna focus on in this topic today. She also has a whole bunch of fans, as you can see from this representative tweet, where uh, Danielle says, Deborah Kag Franson is who I want to be when I grow up. Well, who is this Deborah Kag Franson? Why do we all want to be here? Let's find out by bringing her on stage and talking with her. Greetings. Hi, Brian. The um, how's my how's my audio? Your audio and video are like wonderful. Your Wonderful. I feel bad for Danielle saying that she wants to be with me when she grows up because I'm not yet grown up. I'm I'm still a work in progress. And um, so just as long as we get that right out, out there right at the beginning. Well, that's a, okay. So noted. No problem with overweening <laughs> ego. Check. <We've> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you could make it. And uh, thank I'm you. Glad you could be here. The, this this topic is is one that is of great urgency to mm -hmm. higher education in general and to the forum in particular. Uh, to introduce you, besides introducing your achievements mm -hmm. and fan base, as I just did, let me just ask you, for the rest of 2021, what are you going to be working on the most? What are the big issues that are uppermost in your mind? And what are some mm -hmm. biggest projects that you're going to be spending most of your time on? Mm -hmm. um, there are so many, and, and this is why my staff do get a little... Um, they give me feedback to say, okay, you don't have to do everything. You don't have to boil the ocean. So I'll try to give you different buckets of what we're um, working on. So as you know, I'm fairly new to the University of Utah. We're still bringing together two very disparate units, um, online and continuing education, and turning it using um, IT service management principles to really provide the framework for how we provide services and programs, uh, both to the campus and then to the, the broader community. Um, we have been, as most universities and colleges uh, have, uh, been asked to expand the number and the experimentation in modalities and in credential types. So that, and that's, that's huge, you know, that's, that. I, I say those few words, but it's really the work of a lifetime. And then the third piece of it is really what's uh, very close to my heart, and it's the, the access piece. So the reason we're doing all of this, and especially the reason why we're doing it in higher education and in public higher education, is really to reach those students that we haven't been able to reach before or haven't been as successful as reaching before, whether or not they're degree-seeking students or whether they're community members who need different skills um, to do a better job in the changing workplace. Yeah. So those would be those would be the three buckets. You know, who are we as an organization providing services? Um, how are we expanding and experimenting with modalities and credentials? And how does diversity, equity, and inclusion kind of provide that foundation and the North Star for all that we're doing? I can see how all three of those overlap too. And mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, I think your staff have it right. This is a, an awful lot to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Friends, I have all kinds of questions for our guest, but the purpose of the forum is for you to share your questions and comments. Uh, I'm going to fire off a couple of quick ones, but please reach down to the bottom strip on that screen and then either press the question mark button to type in your question or comment or press the raised hand button if you'd like to join us up here on stage. Uh, I promise you we're very, very polite and happy to welcome you on stage. Mm -hmm. um, one question I, I'd like to ask um, before we uh, get really seriously rolling is, how did you get started on DEI issues? What, what, was the, what was the impetus that sent you down that path? So it's interesting. When I was just out of college, I thought that was my, or like as an undergraduate, I thought that was my awakening about interest in issues of of diversity. And, um, and then I had a flashback to being nine years old 
and standing on the sidelines of a field at gym. Maybe was, maybe we were ten, and I've 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 tried to confirm this with my classmates from that time, mm. and we um, the girls were not allowed to participate in gym because the the theme of that week happened to be football, and girls were not allowed to play football. Mm. So we stood on the sidelines and yelled at, and I'll name him Mr. Carey. Um, we we chanted male chauvinist pig over and over and over again. So if we think about that awakening moment, it was probably that way back in elementary school when I realized that there were some things I was not allowed to do because I was a girl. Mm -hmm. And so I think I got into DEI issues the same way a lot of people do, where, where you come from a very personal place mm -hmm. and then you gain empathy for other groups of people who have likewise been marginalized or excluded from things they want to do. So for instance, shop. And that that caused me to be a very, very, very bad student in home ec because I did not want to be there. I knew how to sew. Thank you. You won't let me work with the drill press. So I'm going to misbehave. So it's um, so it just set up this like a whole dynamic. But that's how I got into it. I got in it through through women's issues. And because I have had such kind and generous um, other people in my life who represent different races, um, sexualities, gender identities, um, they've been able to help me expand my empathy and expand my work so that I can say, by gum, it's it's not just women's issues. There's intersectionality. We need to work across a whole spectrum. So um, I have revealed now more to this group of 106 people than than anybody should know. And um, and so that's, I don't know if that answered your, your question. And Mr. Carey, sorry, but you could have broken the rules for us. <laughs> where where was that? What state was that? New Jersey. Oh, really? South Jersey. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I wasn't too far from you. I was in uh, New York at that time. Yeah. Uh, yep. And I remember the rules about shop. Um, oh, gosh. Don't get me started. Uh, to this day. To this day. Well, but yeah. I'll let it go. I'm letting it go. <laughs> it's in the past. Well, it's great. It's a great personal story, and and, uh, mm -hmm. and I really love the way that you identify that within yourself as a way to build empathy uh, mm -hmm. for or discriminate against it again through other other venues and other access. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, uh, some questions starting to come in already, and mm -hmm. I'd like to begin by uh, let's say bringing up one of them. Uh, one of the questions now from uh, David Hool, uh, who is always a, a wonderful person here in the program. Mm -hmm. uh, and David asks, what are some of the challenges that your work in DEI is facing within the state of Utah? Mm -hmm. um, so Utah is often seen as a monolith. And, and by the way, I'm not yet in Utah. Thank you, pandemic. I'm still in Colorado, um, planning on moving out once vaccines, once there's a public health imperative for us to be actually back on campus. Yeah. But um, so everything I've learned is from a distance, and I just wanted to put that caveat out there. So um, Utah is seen as as a monolithic culture, um, and it's not as monolithic as I perceived it from the outside. So there are huge swaths of the population that are deeply committed to equity. And um, at the University of Utah, I have I've not seen the support for equity, diversity, diversity, and inclusion right up through the highest levels of the organization with consistent um, messaging down and out through the entire organization. That said, there are still some, some issues. In the monolithic culture of the religion, there is there are just L the LGBTQ community, though very well supported in Utah, mm -hmm. um, there are some there are some perspectives that does not, they are discriminated against. So that's, that's, that's an issue in the circles that I run in. It's not the case. So at the university, it's not the case. And again, in huge swaths of the state, it's not the case. And maybe it's just more exposed there than in other parts of the country where it probably exists everywhere, but it's just not as pronounced. Um, I think that that Utah is actually doing it very well. So the other, the flip side of the the monolithic reputation 
is that there is deep empathy toward people and a deep desire to help people. Whoa. And boy, if you can tap into that, the sky's the limit. Um, so, um, and David, I appreciate that question. And, and so for me, my biggest challenge in my position right now is that I want to make sure that my staff are aligned to campus and national practices. So we have so much activity on campus. It's it's nonstop. So we're writing a grant um, to provide uh, better racial equity in uh, a community that's very diverse in terms of race, immigration, sexuality, um, religion. Um, how do we how do we allow the the neighborhoods to really come up with solutions to economic and and racial inequities? Um, and how do we how can we support that work? Um, we have lots of, um, so HR is just all over the, how do you recruit? How do you retain? Um, how do you advance a diverse workforce? How are you inclusive? Um, so, so I feel incredibly privileged to be at Utah. Are there, are there issues here and there? Absolutely. Um, but in general, there is such support, um, for, except it's called EDI there, and I just can't get it straight. Um, um, uh, at the campus and throughout the higher education community, that it's just um, I feel very lucky that I can pursue what's close to my heart as part of my job. David, I don't know if that answered your question or not. It was a little bit rambly. Uh, I thought it was a great a great question and a great answer. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David, and mm -hmm. thank you, uh, Deborah. If you're if you're new to the forum, by the way, that's a great example of a Q and A and how we handle it. So you can always enter those mm -hmm. at the bottom of the screen. And for those of you who are just coming in, hello to folks like Sushma, hello Richard, hello a uh, following guest on the program before Michael Cato, hello, hello Gail, hello Lisa and Julie. It's so many. Uh, we have more questions coming in. I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask. So the next one is from Rachel Niemer at the University mm -hmm. of Michigan who asks, what is the balance for you between meeting faculty members' <laughs> pedagogical needs with advocating against their use of technology that have implicit biases, e.g. proctoring software? Oh, Rachel, 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 you have looked into my inbox, haven't you? That's <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. Um, so this is, uh, this, this is very interesting. Um, and it's, it's a problematic area because as a service organization, what what we what we do is we provide tools to faculty to meet their pedagogical needs and as the tech service unit we're slightly distanced from the practice service unit so the center for teaching and learning uh, excellence or for learning excellence so we try not to get into that practice and yet, when questions come up about implicit biases in the proctoring software, about um, uh, not just in the AI, but in the, their existence um, in general, it does come to us. So it's been um, it's been interesting. And the what I, the the message that I sent out yesterday, I had two pop in at the same time. Um, one came from the surveillance committee, reminding me that a certain university is being sued for its use of proctoring software. And um, another came from the students who said, how can we talk to faculty about assessment? And bingo, that was the one. So then I wrote back to the surveillance committee and we're gonna be meeting with the students to say, what let's let's talk about assessments broadly and let's talk about messages and messaging so that you can have that conversation with your fa with your faculty because it's going to be the faculty to faculty communications and the student to faculty communications that can help influence a broader discussion about what does it mean to assess learning and how can we do it in a way that's that's equitable and then for the surveillance committee I also threw in a Foucault reference just to make them go read something always a good so, Yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, Rachel, I don't know if that that helped answer your question. I mean, that's it's 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 difficult because some faculty truly believe that the only way they can assess is in a proctored exam situation. Mm -hmm. And when we're on campus, it's not a problem. If they want to have a proctored exam uh, situation, we just run them through the exam center and students come in. But when they're remote, that that. It, it 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 introduces a wrinkle. So before, if they were remote, 
they could either go to a local place where they could be proctored in person, they could come to campus, or they could they could opt into a proctoring software situation. But now they're they have no choice. They feel that they have no choice but to engage with this proctoring software. We haven't really had a lot of we we haven't had that many issues with it. I mean, so our our ticket um, the number of tickets is very very low, but it has engendered a wonderful conversation about what does it mean to assess learning on campus that I think is well overdue. Mm, good, 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 good. A uh, great question. Then again, thank you for for a mm -hmm. great. We, we have a couple of questions along a similar uh, topic, and I, I want to bring them together if I can. Uh, mm -hmm. First, this is from uh, Kate Montgomery at uh, SMU. Uh, and mm -hmm. Kate asks, COVID and the forced embracing of online modalities over the past year have illuminated vast inequities within technology. Mm -hmm. What types of systematic changes do you expect to see moving forward? Mm -hmm. Um, Kate, that's a great um, that's a great observation. I mean, I think one of the things that COVID did was it, and I don't know how many times we've heard laid bare over the last year, but it laid bare the inequities in access to technology and broadband. Um, and so I think that's the first big one. Um, I think many universities, the University of Utah included, um, really went out of their way to provide laptops and mobile hotspots for those students who didn't have it. Um, and so I, th I don't see that going away. I, I actually see that increasing. I also see that we're, we're gonna move as, as quickly as we can to really have mobile friendly um, learning opportunities and service opportunities. So I think those are two things, um, prov actually providing the technology um, and the data access, um, uh, probably working statewide on broadband access. And I think that's that I hope broadband comes, uh, read Tracy Matrano. Um, uh, she's definitely an advocate uh, for this, but really getting, looking at broadband as it's, it's a utility. Everybody has to have it at this point. Um, mobile first, designing for mobile first. And then the other piece is, it's, um, and everybody here has done it, that slow walk of saying, that was emergency remote. And we want to have well-designed online opportunities and hybrid opportunities. I think that we will see more large lectures go away in favor of asynchronous short videos and then a flipped classroom kind of thing where, where students go into recitation or sections um, mm -hmm. to engage with problem solving and peer learning. So I think there's gonna be um, a tremendous shift even for our on the ground courses there. Um, and Kate, I don't know if that answered your question and I hope I got your name right there because your little question went off my screen, so. It's, it's Kate Montgomery, I, I think that was Thank great. You. Kate, please, please follow up if, you, if you'd like to add more. Mm -hmm. Uh, now that we've been uh, showing you the different ways that the uh, Q&A box works, uh, let me just uh, show you how the uh, video box works. Uh, let me just add to the stage um, the uh, awesome uh, longtime friend of the program, uh, Tom Haynes. Whoop. Hello, Tom. Hang on one second. I'm Good afternoon. I think we've lost somebody. Well, I managed to really carefully just uh, um, switch screens there. And there we are, Great. all three of you. Am I looking at the right way? You're looking. Hi, Tom. <laughs> no, I'm looking the wrong way. Hi, Tom. Okay. <laughs> hey, thank you, Tom. So I was curious about you had mentioned in your in the in the uh, lead up to this this uh, your discussion of modalities, and mm -hmm. um, I was kind of curious what you meant by that because one of the mm -hmm. things that I've been working on, as I think about technology and how it relates to instruction is this you know the, the pandemic has really shown um how we um have developed this continuum of instruction and what mm -hmm. you know when you take away some parts of those tools such as being able to be in a room with somebody mm -hmm. you know how do you make those other pieces work so now we put those tools back and what can we learn from that you know kind of fluid instruction method um, mm -hmm. right now i'm kind of starting to work on a paper on you know, should we really stop talking about online education? I and mean, should it all be, you know, based on the pedagogical needs rather than some arbitrary right. classification of, you know, you must have a computer and a modem to take this class kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think you sort of have to modem. I just showed my age there. Um, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I have to say your example of uh, your example of the the shot the uh, the football in the shop class really kind of blew me away because you know I know how old Brian is and you, you look like you're not as old as we are so the oh, idea yeah. that you were facing that <laughs> when you were <laughs> uh, yeah. in an era when I was also in high school but no this idea of uh, you know we we when we first did this distance education remote education whatever we called it 20 years ago wherever mm -hmm. you were there was a need to have these very specific boxes because there wasn't an assumption that everybody was going to have access to that and be able to access mm -hmm. that. We're still not quite there yet, but you know, we're a lot closer than we were a year ago. And, uh, but you know, I, I want to use technology as a way of augmenting what I'm doing in my you know pedagogy and not arbitrarily decide, okay, this is online. This is in person. I want to choose online when it makes the most sense to do online. I want to choose in person when it makes the most sense to do in person. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what you're heading talking about when you talk mm -hmm. about modalities, or am I totally messing with that? No, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right, Tom. And I think uh, the, some of the affordances of COVID, and we've been told specifically, don't lose those learnings. Like campus leadership has said that, and I I can put the learnings into two buckets. One. Um, a, a greater percentage of faculty have a greater degree of comfort with tools, technology tools, um, because they've had to, like they've just had to jump in. And they, a greater percentage of faculty have a greater openness to different practices that those tools or those platforms afford. So those, I think those are the those are the big learnings. When it comes to modalities, I think that in general, we'll tra we're talking about either fully online, and then there's a subset of that fully online, mostly asynchronous and self-paced. Um, so think about like Mookie, but not but not mm -hmm. quite MOOCs. Right. Um, and then and then it goes all the way to the the synchronous remote and and trying to come up with definitions so that people understand what they're doing in part so that we can we can market them i mean there's no other way to say it so that we can market mm -hmm. it to students right. so that they understand what they're getting into so if we say for instance this course is online but they sign up for the course and they're meeting three times a week for a 50 minute lecture and it just happens to be over video conference is that really online and and so we're trying to to kind of flip it and see it from the student perspective as we come up with naming conventions for those different types of modalities mm -hmm. and i think that i'm seeing a, a willingness also across the campus to say let's it's almost it's it's hybrid but it's it's hybrid like in all caps where um where there's some asynchronous and there's some in person and there's some synchronous remote all mixed into right. one class experience so it's it's that's what i mean when i when i talk about experimenting with modalities i even mean like mashup maybe it's mashup mm -hmm. maybe it's like mashup modality um that we're really talking about because mm -hmm. i think you're still going to have fully online and you're going to still have fully in person but even that in person is going to be mediated but with with tech tools and platforms um and then there's just like right. all of this in between and and it's exciting because we don't know what it's going to look like but it's terrifying because we don't know how to tell people how to we don't know how to describe it so that they're coming into the right experience that meets their their learning needs and meets their life needs does that so there were just are you running up against no absolutely yeah are you running up against institutional or accreditation barriers as you start to work through that um not yet not just the marketing side not okay. not yet so um i think okay. the that the 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 last conversation with an accrediting body and it was it was the general one it wasn't like a specific it wasn't um a bet or anything like that it was let's talk about the learning outcomes let's talk about um it was interesting so you know there's still the contact hours piece that we have to mm -hmm. to be careful of um but i think that and, and maybe it's wishful thinking tom but i think that there there just might be a, a redefining of what does a contact hour mean and what does and who are you having contact mm -hmm. with is it does it have to be the right. instructor of record or can it be a coach or can it be a facilitator or like what what is that measure and so that's um so no there's uh, we haven't gotten that far down the road to say these are our definitions hey creditors what do you think um but i don't think we're planning on okay. any 
outside the realm of what's happening already. Good questions. Yeah, the contact error question is a big one in my mind, and that mm -hmm. and how that how that plays out. I, you know, realistically, uh, I you know I did, I did I've done some hard analyses of my own classes classes and just thought about instruction and maybe twenty percent contact hours and then the other eighty percent asynchronous where the students right. are you know and then I'm there to mm -hmm. be there on the edges to right. make sure they head down the right path. But I mean, they've still got videos and stuff like that. But right. anyway. I will I will exit the stage before Brian unceremoniously dumps me. <laughs> the, so. the, 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 yes. the gong or the hook? The hook. The hook. The hook. So. With the the and let someone else have to. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thanks, uh, Tom. That's a good question, and uh, and Deborah, thank you again for the for the detailed answers. Uh, we have we have more questions piling in, uh, and I want to make sure that everyone gets a uh, a chance to ask them. Uh, mm -hmm. and one comes from Jody Green at uh, UCSC. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. Hello, Jody. Hi, Jody. Hi, Jody. I'll get it. You're good. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, and thanks so much. This is really great. Um, I have a question about uh, what, if anything, you all are doing at Utah for um, preparing students to become effective online learners. Do you have a sort of orientation to how to be a great online learner? Because we're finding that one of the keys to addressing the persistent concerns about equity associated with remote and online education right. is to make sure that we provide robust learning support. So I work mm -hmm. with our online education team. I run a teaching center and, you know, we are in charge of remote instruction support. But mm -hmm. what we found is there's not a lot on the on the learner facing side, the student facing right. side. That, that goes hand in hand. What, you know, we built a Keep Learning mm -hmm. website along with our Keep Teaching website. But mm -hmm. beyond that, how do we help undergraduate students become good online learners? Because it requires a lot of skills that a traditional right. in-person learner may not have. Not that we train them to be good learners either, but we can talk about that another time. So that's my question. Right. I know, and it's great. And I wish I wish I had a really good answer and to say we have we've got this dialed in because we don't. Um, I think that one of the things that I've seen um in the planning stages is a um a bridge course, like an on-ramp course that includes some of those things. How are but it's it's more general, it's not necessarily for the online, but it's how are you a good student? Um, how do you manage uh uh, the technology, how do you manage mental health issues? So it's it's a little bit more general. And I would love to hear from other people who who have things because I will, I'm meeting with the, the student government next week and I would love to bring that up for them. Um, and, and if there is something out there to everybody at the University of Utah, I'm sorry, I don't know about it. Um, so, um, and if there's anybody from the, the U on there and they just want to put that in the chat and say, Debbie, you don't know this yet. How do you not know this yet? Please tell me. One, one hot tip that I'll give you and then I'll get off is. Yes, please. Found that, um, that, uh, if you're going to use, you know, short videos for this, that uh -huh. to have students give advice to other students about learning is a lot more effective than having faculty give advice to students about learning. Oh, um, nice. to their peers. Um, and they, as you know, okay. And to us. So anyway, that's just one that's thought. That's great. And is it, are they using some sort of annotation software to do that in video or? Um, no, we literally made short videos, uh, you know, that we posted. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Oh, that's great. Um, and so if we were to do an online orientation module that included stuff about learning, we would probably use students. Um, I'm also going to put in the chat a wonderful set of resources that were developed Thank um, you. at another institution uh, on this topic, but I have to go and find them. So Okay. Thank you, Jody. I, I, I appreciate this and thanks for adding another thing to do. Sure. <laughs> no, but this is this is a good thing. This is a good thing. Never ending, right? Uh, and isn't that the best part? Yeah. Thank okay. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, Jody. Bye, um, Deborah. And if anybody okay. Uh, um, has uh, examples we'd like to share, uh, please uh, please uh, share through, again, the question box or uh, through the chat box. Um, Deborah, we have one from uh, Kathleen Freitag, who's at Portland. Uh, mm -hmm. she, we're navigating the same and discussing digital literacy with a tiered approach. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, people mentioned peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, Lisa Durf, Melanie Hogue, and uh, Mathieu Pleur. Mathieu, we're coming to your question, I promise. Um, <laughs> The, the, thing that, the part the students struggle with the most is learning to understand the practices and boundaries of every instructor. 
Uh, so uh, that's that's a really, really uh, nice thing. Say a little bit more about it. Could you repeat that, please? Sure. Uh, oh. The part that students struggle with the most is learning to understand the practices and boundaries of every instructor. Uh -huh. Can you give some examples? What they value, how to get the grade or learning they want, yeah. um, and so on. Um, and Mathieu is a, a superb commentator, uh, and he has a question coming up. Uh, but let me just... Um, uh, Mention that uh, Jody, thank you for that question. And we have another one, another video question coming in from Carolyn Coward, who has one of the best jobs in the world. She works. She does. APL, just so I have to bring her nice. up <laughs> out of pure envy. Hello, Carolyn. Carolyn. I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> so I have to. Number one, I am a huge fan of Deb K. K. Franson. I Break bought the T-shirt. I'm wearing the. I've got the bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I'm fangirling right now. This woman is brilliant. Oh, she stop. is kind. She has oh. foresight, like you would believe. Yeah, I'm. I'm such a fan. Well, thank you. I'm yeah. also a fan of this guy too, right, Doctor Alexander up there. I'm just the host, man. I'm just the host. Yeah. Thank you. So, so my question is: How is the University of Utah handling? Um, DEI or EID, however you want to, mm -hmm. inclusion and equity issues amongst um, faculty ranks, uh, mm -hmm. tenured and non-tenured, and administration. Mm -hmm. There's a huge equity and inclusion disparity in higher ed uh, administration and faculty. Mm -hmm. So what, what is your institution doing about this? Um, so there is a VP, VP for EDI, so cabinet level. Um, there's also within faculty affairs, and I don't know, I don't, uh, as, it might be an AVP level, but, but you know, a, a, a title, like an acronym um, for uh, faculty diversity. And so they are, so they're working hand in hand to make sure that, that we're doing the best job we can to recruit and retain, um, especially faculty of color, but, um, but along all, like to ensure diversity um, uh, across the across the faculty ranks, um, of course, this is problematized by by the the decrease in tenure tenure track faculty, mm -hmm. um, and so that's um, so so we'll just we'll just kind of set that that kind of not so nice piece of it aside for the second uh, for a second. But what I see is absolute commitment. Like I said, it's it's it's. It's stunning. It's encouraging. Um, and so then when I write, for instance, when I say something to my staff and say, could we please bring in a content expert to do a content analysis of like, just pick one course and let's see, it, it, are these materials and are the practices inclusive? What I hear from, from my boss is go, this is exactly what we need to do. Um, there is such... Um, there there's so h again hr is on board like it feels like everybody is aligned and i think if there's one thing that i if there's one word that i pull out it's this alignment and if people are on their own campus is saying i don't know where to start aligning yourself like just making that one phone call um writing that one email uh, just to say to somebody else, what are you doing, and can we replicate or can we join with you? I think is is amazing. We um, in our unit, we also set up a um, and and yes, I'm 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 a little bit trend for once. I'm trendy. Like we're calling it the Jedi Council because they wanted to call it, the, and I was like, please call it the Jedi Council, please, please. I will get you gifts if you call it the Jedi Council. Okay, so I'll it's the Justice, it. Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Council. I love and so, that. You no, know, isn't that awesome? I and, love and, that. And I, I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't distract from the the importance of it or the the absolute seriousness, the life and death of it, but it just does add just well, a little bit of Well, search your feelings to find the truth. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I had to. I'm sorry. I know I you did. That's okay. That's okay. We forgive you for that. Um, so, um, so what's, what we, now I've lost my train of thought. 
all I can think about is is that. Um, yeah, but, bad Star Wars uh, jokes. Okay. No, I, yeah. it's okay. So what we're doing is also aligning with what's happening at the campus. So for instance, the museum has the Black Refractions exhibit from, from Harlem. And so we make sure that we provide a services if they want. Do you need some video? Do you need do you need an uh, an asynchronous tour? Um, can we have a virtual tour of that? So we're trying to find out who on campus is doing what, and then making sure that our staff know that these are available. Um, Angela Davis was in town um, a couple weeks ago. Um, a big shout out to Amber Ruffin. Um, her, her new book with her sister, um, it, it's some, and I can't remember the title, I'm in the middle of it now. And for, for white people, it's probably very, I mean, for me, it's very uncomfortable because I read it and say, oh, please, please, I, I hope that, nothing like that has ever emerged from my mouth, but I, I don't, I don't know. Um, and on the other hand, wow, this is what people of color put up with every single day. So we've got these voices on campus and it's a click away. I mean, it's literally a click away. You click it, there's your video, you're on, you can watch it after the fact when you're on the treadmill. I mean, it's, it, the U has made this so easy for people to access different voices that I think it's just it's it's raising awareness, which is is that first step. And with HR right behind saying this is how you advertise for jobs, this is how you write job descriptions, this is how um, this is this is what is important in having a diverse pool and making sure that the finalist pool is diverse as well. Um, that's, I mean, to have that as just wave upon wave of effective practices, I believe will make a, a difference in the long term. It's um, the, the, yeah, I, 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 I can't say enough good things about it. So it sounds it. like it's a multitude of efforts that are all kind Absolutely. of meeting in the middle and supporting each other and Correct. using sort of the same language and the same tone and exactly. multi-pronged effort. Exactly. That's wonderful. Multi-pronged, aligned. There we go. Back to alignment. Excellent. Yes. Carolyn, thank you so much. Carolyn, so good to see you. Thanks. You Thank yes, you both. I get you. Um, we have uh, a, a whole bunch of folks in the uh, chat have been sharing examples of uh, different resources for this. Uh, and I've been sharing them back so everyone can see them. Um, but um, some of these are very, very powerful. We have more questions coming in and we also have 15 minutes left. And I wanna make sure that everyone gets a chance to uh, ask their questions. Uh, we've had uh, John O'Brien came in, the president of Educause. Who's uh, that? Who's I'm that? I'm sorry, who's that? What's in? Okay. Jo oh, John O'Brien. Okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's a good name. Sorry. It is a good name. Yeah. It's spelled wrong, but, but you know, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good name. Um, and, uh, and, Sorry, John. <laughs> uh, and he asked, is there a quote, restore, evolve, transform, unquote, conversation happening relative to DEI? So restore, evolve, transform. And I'll, I'll flash this on the screen too. I'll make sure that everyone. Yeah, please do. Because that's a that's an interesting one. Okay. Um, not as a quote, John. Can you say what you mean by um, restore? I can I can get evolve and transform. So I don't. I I don't know. Not not as not as those three words. No, not not that I'm working on, mm -hmm. and yet all three of those words resonate. And so, except for that restore, which I just want to poke into a little bit more, but but certainly that evolve and transform. I mean, I I hope what we have is is transformation. Um, that that we we and maybe that's why restore isn't isn't jumping out at me as as a as a motivating verb. Um, evolve, yes, but I think at this point, given everything that that happened in 2020 with the murder of George Floyd with the the just the racial reckoning all of that it's got to be transformed because we it, and 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 transform can be can be abrupt and painful don't get me wrong and scary but i don't see any other way but like um the way carolyn said that that there's just 
from lots of different places, the same tone, the same message to affect real broad change. I think that's the only thing we can we can do. So, um, John, I don't know if it was a multiple choice question, um, but if it's a multiple choice question, I'm going for C. My answer is C, uh, transform. Um, but I think there are probably places where people are not ready for transform or institutions are not. So maybe it is about evolve and restore, um, even though I don't know what restore means in this. Well, in this in, in the chat, John mentions that he's having some audiovisual problems or else he'd join us, but he said that you got it right. Um, on okay. C, he says C is always the right choice. Um, so Okay, that's... good to know. Anytime I have a class with a non-proctor <laughs> or proctored assessment, I'm going with C for all of them. <laughs> right down. Thank you, John. <laughs> we have some more. And thank you, John, indeed. Um, we, we, have, uh, we have some more questions and also another resource to share. Uh, this is from uh, Rachel. Thank you for resources, everybody. By the way, Again, Rachel shared. This is a, a link from uh, her um, for a link for resources new for students new to online learning. Um, and so I'll uh, I'll tweet a bunch of these out uh, when we're done. And, thank you. Uh, it's a great set. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, we have a, a, another question along these lines um, that um, I've been waiting to ask. This is from Leslie Harris at Bucknell. Uh, mm -hmm. Asks. How do these DEI issues intersect with IT in particular? Mm -hmm. How are you using your awareness to change policies and practices in IT? Mm -hmm. um, excellent question. And this is where this is where I feel most comfortable because this is where I've worked so long with Educause. And a shout out to John O'Brien and Educause um, for really privileging and forwarding and making um, very salient uh, DEI issues across all the offerings of, of Educause. Um, and so Leslie, what, what we have done um, over time is we have, we have community groups in Educause. Um, again, it, it can't, this is the commercial part of, of this Q and A, but um, the women in IT, the diversity in IT, the young professionals in IT, all of these groups are really aligned around how do we recruit, retain, include and promote a diverse IT workforce. And um, so I see it as intersecting with IT in a couple of ways. First, uh, we need to we need to make sure that our services in IT meet the needs of the population we serve. And so we want to make sure that we have either a really honed sense of empathy and um, and compassion and seeing things from other people's perspectives to provide those services and or that our workforce, the, the employees in our units are actually representative of the of the the student body and the faculty body and the community that we serve. Um, so that's that's one big thing, just just to make sure that that we have diversified our our workforce, and we have practices for that. Um, uh, Coupa HR is is one great organization that you can look at. They've made diversity, equity, and inclusion um, a central part of the work they do. Working closely with Educause, most HR units um, are members of of this organization, and so there's another piece of alignment. Really making sure that that your HR is supportive of this and and has a broad understanding of it. And I, I, I'm i sure there are some HR units that don't, but but you can also point them to these freely available resources and thinking that's out there already. Um, and then there's there's this idea too of, of inclusive design practices and inclusive pedagogy that sometimes that some units, some IT units are responsible for. And in that case, it means working with faculty to help them understand that the des design decisions they make for their, their courses, their programs, and even for individual classes have an impact, positive or negative, on the students that they teach. And so really raising awareness about the impact of their their design decisions, I think, is um, is important for IT. And I want to do a shout out to Amy Collier from Middlebury, 
who has a great article in um, Educause Review on inclusive design and design justice and what design justice is and and it can and it could work anywhere it can work for programs and for services is you you put at the center of your design so when you have the persona that you're designing for that persona is from a marginalized community or a marginalized population um, or has a marginalized um, identity and if you design for them it's actually designing for everybody, but by putting them at the center, you don't lose them. The way we usually do design is our persona looks a lot like us, um, highly educated and um, and probably in a majority culture. And we design for that. And then we miss out on the the breadth and the, the potential reach of our services and programs. Design justice turns it on its head. And so I'd, I'd really recommend reading that um, that article by Amy. Yeah, and also, just to plug, uh, Amy, another really, really good Future Trends Forum guest. Um, yes. Uh, we have um, even more questions, but also, friends, we've got seven minutes to go. So I want to make sure that you know we don't lose anybody. Uh, and here is one of those questions that uh, I mentioned before that I, I threatened to bring up. This is from uh, Mathieu Plour. Uh, Mathieu asks, how do you address faculty who think that college is a sink or swim experience? And are therefore reluctant to pick up more caring approaches. Mathieu, I wish I could speak French with you, but I cannot. I can only say some curse words. I will not, but I will answer that question. This is um, this is sometimes difficult because, and I actually had this discussion with somebody in engineering earlier in the week, where there was, and this is lovely, um, there was a commitment to access. Um, there was a commitment to equity, and I said, "Okay, can you promise me that you do that you do not have engineering courses where um, you say in the first day of class, look to your left, look to your right, two of you will be gone. Um, please tell me that you don't have that because if you've got that, then all of your talk about equity and inclusion doesn't." it doesn't ring true because you will be having assessments that are sink or swim. So this is where the, the student voice comes in. And this is where we're working with student government to say, let's have you, it's, it's sort of what Jody was saying, the student to student teaching is effective. And I think the student messaging to um, the, the faculty is also effective. But you should know that I'm also having to say, why do we have um, non-credit courses? Why do we have professional certifications when they're not our our traditional core product of a degree? And that it it is it's it's constant communication and it's also persuasive communication about this is the mission of higher education. The mission of higher education is is uh, the creation of of new knowledge but it's also the dissemination of that and the product the the way we package it doesn't matter as much as getting it out there and sometimes that new knowledge is is skills that non-matriculated students can use in the workplace to affect the social good to improve the social fabric and so that seems to resonate with some but not all faculty and and if you've got different messaging, I'd love to hear it because this is hard. And, uh, and and he will follow up. And he also just shared a uh, really nice link that I'm tweeting out uh, to his uh, persona worksheet assignment. Okay, um, nice. That, that's very, very good. And thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, thank you for that great exchange between the two of you. Um, we have another one from uh, Sally. A couple of these actually are, are, are specifically focused on individual technologies. So let me bring up a uh, uh, one, Andrew Zubiri, uh, who is, among other things, someone who survived at least one of my classes. Um, and uh, <laughs> and he asked, how can higher ed come up with safeguards against facial recognition and AI bias in ed tech tools? Holy cannoli, I don't know, Andrew. Um, but here are some ideas that I have. I think it has to start with putting pressure on the companies that are developing it. So I think one of the more frustrating um, periods of time that I had was probably 10 or 12 years ago when we were trying to influence companies to develop 
accessible technology? Like, why isn't that, why do we have to be the ones that uh, individually, all 3000 of us putting this into our contracts? Why don't you just design tools that are accessible? And so for me, I think this is the next stage of it where we have to put pressure on companies to say, design tools that protect privacy that don't have um, that don't have biases in them. It, it will never be perfect, but I think that collectively as higher education, if we can put pressure on, maybe that will have an influence. Um, when I first heard about the surveillance committee at the University of Utah, I was I was taken aback a little bit because they wanted to come in and 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 have oversight over proctoring software and maybe Zoom, but maybe not. When is bo- whereas before they were really concerned about cameras on campus and and privacy and surveillance and um, and now I'm I've I've come very quickly to embrace that because I also think that faculty involvement and researcher involvement in this can help us leverage our voices with those vendors and to say no this is not this is not appropriate this is not acceptable and if collectively we say that then maybe there will be change well that's a great question and uh fantastic yes. uh there are a couple of uh, uh notes on the uh, in the chat in response to this elena o'malley mentions a documentary called coded bias Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Ford, uh adds that we should insist on an AI ethics statement from every vendor that we work with. Nice. Um, and we have a question from uh, the awesome Sally Muriamu, uh, also in Portland State. So we've got uh, all coast represented here today. Uh, and she asks, what are your thoughts about platforms like Circle In, where students have learning communities online separate from their teaching faculty? Mm-hmm. Um. My thoughts are I'm all for it. And I don't, I, students have always had separate learning communities. So in person on the ground, they've all, all developed those. I think that the only, the only caveats I see with that are, are these safe places for students and is there equitable participation? So if those things could be, could be built into it somehow, or, or have students become aware of those um, inclusivity and equity and safe space um, places? I'm I'm absolutely all for it because the more the more that uh, students take ownership of their own learning, and again, uh, I'll go back to Jody one more time. That peer to peer learning is so powerful. I think that's wonderful. I think there's some caveats, but um, we can address those. I'd like to. Um take advantage, shameless advantage of my role here um, and uh, and take the last minute to ask you a question uh, for myself, which is uh, I'd like to imagine how would higher education IT look different, uh, say five years from now, if we all committed to the kind of work you're talking about, everything from changing our design persona to exploring uh, different ways of uh, training and supporting our staff, well, if we just hit fast forward on that vision, what does it mean mm-hmm. in five years? How are we different? I think we're fu- we are fulfilling uh, our access mission. We are reaching different communities and different student persona or persona with with um, with the content they need when they need it and acknowledge the fact that there is not a straight line, even though we, we can only report success if, if we report a straight line toward completion of degrees or um, certificates. I think that um, the humanities will rule in my, in, my, um, in my lovely space, because I think they're at the basis, is a basis of a lot of that. And there's layering on of different, um, uh, more skills-based tools or technology on that, but everybody's got that deep grounding um, in it. And that was a shameless, that was shameless for you, Brian, wasn't it? Just to go right for the humanities at the very end. But um, I'm, so that's, that's I, I think we're fulfilling the access mission. And I think that 
we have a wide breadth of opportunities that run from the traditional to the very new and that that it's that the way the tools are provided and implemented is equitable and inclusive so that's my that's my happy place and i'm going to i'm going for that and um thank you i i do i didn't say thank you at the beginning brian this it's an honor to to be with you and be on here so um oh. thank you for that and thank you to everybody for being so generous and sharing both with questions and resources you are what makes um higher ed tick and i'm i'm grateful to be able to be here with you well thank you so much for saying that that was beautifully okay. said and a marvelous guest thank you so much for everything thank you we're we just blasted past the end of the hour so we have to wrap things up uh one quick question Deborah, how do we keep up with you what's the best way to track your your work at utah i don't know <laughs> I, wish, I wish i knew we don't we don't yet have a website i every time i go on twitter i fail badly like really badly like really badly, um, I've I've given up. So I don't I'm I don't know for now. Uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. You can follow me on LinkedIn. Well, there dude. it is. I knew there was something. I knew and, there was something out there. And we'll bring you back later on too. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Take, Take care. care, everybody. Now, don't leave everybody because we just have to touch on what's happening for the next uh, few weeks. So just to give you a little flash forward, remember we have people who are going to be talking about reinventing a public university. We have analytics, leadership, campus closures, disruption, and gaming education. That's just a few topics. We also have many, many venues for keeping up this conversation, uh, everywhere from LinkedIn and Twitter uh, to Slack and Facebook. And if you'd like to go back and look at previous, previous sessions uh, where we focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, or we focused on transforming higher education IT or both, just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. Thank you all uh, today for all these wonderful questions and great resources. It's an absolute delight. Um, during this wild time, it's been especially good spending time with you. Thank you for all of your contributions. It's great to be part of this community. Now, until next time, please take care, be safe, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye.